Hey there, Father Doug here, one of your uh, national chaplains. I want to talk to you today about uh, one way that I found we can diagnose rather quickly the spiritual condition of somebody that we don't know very well, but we want to, to evangelize. And I'll, I'll uh, explain this to you by way of a story. So when I was in my evangelical seminary long before I was Catholic, way back on August 28th, 1990. I got caught in a tornado. So here's what happened. I, would, I was uh, starting a church in Peoria, Illinois, and I had to drive two hours and 45 minutes every day to the north side of Chicago. Uh, I had to leave my house in Peoria by 4.30 so that I would get to the uh, intersection of Interstate 55 and the Tri-State 294 before 7.30 in the morning so that I would beat the traffic and be able to get up to my first class on time. And so I was heading up, uh, I was about an hour away, so not quite yet to the Tri-State, and my alternator light came on in my uh, high mile, high mileage, uh, older model, Honda Accord. And I'm, I'm pretty much stupid as far as fixing cars or knowing anything about cars, but I did know that the alternator light means that the alternator is not charging the battery. And so you can only drive so far on a battery that's not charging. So I drove up to my seminary, I went to my classes, and, and as soon as I could, I called this Honda Volvo dealership that I used to see uh, to the east as I was heading north on Interstate 55. And I asked them, um, could you get me in this afternoon? Like, I have to get back to Peoria. My alternator light has come on, so I need you to, to put in a new alternator, I think. Um, can I get back to you? I've driven about an hour. I've got about an hour and a half to get to where you are in Plainfield, Illinois. Um, can I make it back to you? And then could you fix my car and get me on the road? And they said, yes, if you get here like 3.30, We'll, uh, we'll take care of it and have you on the road by five and you can get home. So this was on August 28th, 1990. I'm not really good at remembering dates, but on this day, August 28th, 1990, the only F5 tornado ever to go through Chicago or one of its suburbs came while I was waiting in the waiting room for my car to be finished a mile away from the Honda Volvo dealership in Plainfield, Illinois. And it was like crazy, really super high wind. Um, people called to us, get away from the windows, come in here to this room where there's no windows. And we all ran in there and the tornado came by. And then sirens everywhere, red lights, and it was just crazy. And everybody went home to check on their families, their houses, um, and the, the head of the garage for this Honda Volvo dealership came and said, uh, Mr. Grandin, um, we're all going home, but the fellow who's working on your car is going to stay until he finishes. He's almost done. And usually we don't let anybody in the shop, but because we're all going home, you can go back and talk to him if you want until he's done. And so I went back to talk to him. And on my way walking back there, the Holy Spirit prompted me. And I'm like, I'm, I know I'm making myself out to be super spiritual and a, like a super evangelist, which I'm, I'm not. I try and I tried then. But I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me to try to evangelize this mechanic. And so I went back there and it was really, um, it was really authentic. This was an authentic, friend, friendly conversation. It was authentic. I said to him, man, that was scary, wasn't it? We really could have died. And we didn't know how dangerous it was, but we knew it was a tornado. And he said, yeah, I was, I was like really scared. Now I had learned, and this is the whole point of this little talk today, I had learned um, sometime before two diagnostic questions that one can ask to try to rather quickly find out where a person is in faith. No faith, 
misinformed faith, whatever, how to rather quickly diagnose where they are. And I think even though I learned those uh, at an evangelical conference, I think they work quite nicely for us Catholics. So um, before I tell you what the questions were that I asked this fellow, I'll say that uh, perhaps you'll remember that in the Gospel of John, John informs the reader why he's writing the Gospel. He says, I'm writing these things so that you might come to know that Jesus is the Christ. And then, of course, experience forgiveness and salvation. I, I'm writing this to you so that you might come to know that Jesus is the Christ. And then in 1 John 5.13, his first letter, I'm going to read it to you because this is critical. 1 John 5.13, the first epistle of John, he has a different purpose. He's writing to Christians. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So these are believers. Those reading the gospel are not believers. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Note that, that you may know. The others, he's wanting to coax them to believe through the gospel. Here he's writing to Christians, and I'm writing this to you, he says, that you might know that you have eternal life, 1 John 5.13. So with 1 John 5.13 in mind, the first question that I learned to ask someone uh, was, um, if you were to die today, God forbid, we hope it doesn't happen, do you know with confidence that you would have eternal life? Because John says we can know. John says we can know. So I, I, I in, in, with great confidence, based upon the promise of Jesus, who forgave my sin and is giving me grace to walk in, in the light, I have confidence that if I died today, I would have eternal life. I hope you do as well. I know Jesus objectively, God the Father, they're the last judges of it. We can be mistaken, but, but Jesus gives us promises uh, about eternal life, and we can embrace them. We're walking in the light. So I asked this fellow after some time of conversation, um, if you would have died today, God forbid, uh, but in this tornado, do you have confidence that you would have eternal life beyond this life? And you'll get lots of answers to that. People will say, I've never thought about it. They might say, can anybody really know? They might say, I hope so. But this fellow said, I think maybe not. I think maybe I wouldn't have eternal life. And I said, could I ask you another question? And he said, sure. Um, and he's working away in my car. And I said, um, if you were today, if you would have died today, and again, God forbid, I hope you live a long time, but if you were to die, if you would have died today, and you, you, you were to stand before God, and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And again, you'll get many answers. Some people will say, uh, I would say I've tried my best. Some people will say, um, I hope some. Of, I hope I've done more good things than bad things. Somebody who's biblically literate and genuinely, genuinely Christian would say, "Well, the Bible promised me that Jesus died for my sins, and if I place my faith in Him, um, I could gain entrance to heaven and to eternal life." And I would say that to God, and that's like bingo. Um, even genuine believers um, maybe can't enunciate that. They'll say something less clear because they need to be better catechized. But this, this fellow said, um, you know, I, I just don't have confidence that God would let me in. And he said, and then he said something really amazing. He said, my mother-in-law has been talking about this with me. And I said, that's amazing that you have a Christian mother-in-law. And he said, yeah, she's been talking about how I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ that he would forgive my sins if only I would ask. And then he said, and she encourages me to watch this Baptist preacher um, on TV named Charles Stanley. And I said, Charles Stanley, like he's amazing. He's our favorite. You know, Charles Stanley gave me a preaching class. I know Charles Stanley a little bit because I was with a small number of, of young preachers. And, 
and we had we spent a, a couple days with Charles Stanley up in the North Woods, of Wisconsin. He was amazed that I knew Charles Stanley. I still highly respect Charles Stanley now. He just retired. He's in his 80s. But um, this gave us a connection. And so I said, you know what? Um, I, I do not want to offend you. I, I don't want to pressure you in any way that you feel uncomfortable. But uh, someone shared with me the same thing that your mother-in-law shared with you. And uh, I read through the Gospel of Matthew and this fellow answered my questions over several months, and then he challenged me to surrender my life to Jesus Christ because I had no confidence that if I died, I would have eternal life. And so he challenged me one day, this fellow, to receive Christ. And I said to him, I don't, Dan, I don't know if God exists. I don't know if what I read about Jesus is true in the Gospel of Matthew. I don't even know how to pray. All I know is that I... I feel the weight of my sin and I need forgiveness and I'm pretty unhappy and I want a better life. And I told him, Dan, Dan said to me very wisely, Doug, that's exactly how you pray. You just tell God that, something like that. That's how you pray. And I said, well, I could do that. And that's when I knelt down and I prayed that kind of a prayer. And for the very first time, I felt God's presence and forgiveness. So I told this fellow that and I said, you know, I said, even now as you're finishing up my car, you could lay down your tools and we could have a quick word of prayer together. And I said, I don't want to pressure you at all. Um, these things happen in their own time. But if you're ready to do that, I'd be happy to lead you in a prayer. And to my shock, he said, I'm ready. I'd love to do that. Now, most of the time when we evangelize, we often we think we're not successful if a person hasn't received Christ, but evangelization most of the time is sharing what we can, and we and God uses us to move a person forward, a foot, quarter mile, however long it is, in their spiritual journey, and then somebody else comes along, and somebody else, somebody else, just like his mother-in-law and Doctor Stanley had been sharing with him, and I was just one who was there at the right time, the right place. Thank God I responded to that prompt. Thank God I rather quickly diagnosed where he was with the help of these two questions. And here, here he was, he said, I'm ready. He laid down his tools and I led him in a simple, we used to call that a sinner's prayer. I think it's a great term still. Uh, I, learned, I learned that from Billy Graham. Um, you can find that online, just Billy Graham's Simple Sinner's Prayer. And I, I led him in that, and I affirmed with him that he really meant to turn his life to, over to Jesus Christ, that he wanted a new start, he wanted forgiveness, he wanted to be a better man, he wanted to, to learn what Jesus taught, and he wanted to live that, and he said yes. And he finished my car, and it's just like I think it says of um, Philip the Evangelist early in the book of Acts after Philip shared faith, uh, by God's providence with that, remember that, that fellow who was going back to Africa in the desert um, outside of Jerusalem. Um, it says that, I think it says that Philip went away rejoicing. And that's how we were. We just went away rejoicing. And it was amazing. And when I got in my car to head home, I called a whole bunch of people and said, listen to this. I got to evangelize somebody after this tornado. And he received Christ and we were rejoicing. You know, I called one of my seminary professors. I was in an evangelization class at that, at that time. He, he rejoiced with me. So um, I'm going to finish this up, but just these two questions. 1 John 5.13, first of all, that passage, I'm writing to you who know Christ, that you might know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5.13, that's the basis of these questions. Like, if you died today, God forbid. Do you know with confidence? I usually say for certain. That might be a little theological iffy. But do you know with confidence that you, have, you would have eternal life? And then the second question, if you died today and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Let me add a little PS here. When I was starting a church, while I was in seminary in Peoria, with no money, um, no people, we just started it knocking on doors in our neighborhood and evangelized people, and people began to come, and our church began to grow. 
until it got large enough uh, for uh, where it was able to support a full-time pastor and then I moved on and they called a full-time pastor but so we were knocking on doors um, and one day we knocked in the store uh, and a woman an older woman answered I'm almost positive she was Catholic uh, and we and I asked her these questions and she invited us in uh, to, to talk further about it and I noticed she had a crucifix a beautiful crucifix on the wall in her living room and I asked her these questions and to the first one if you died today would you know with confidence you have eternal life she said can anybody really know that I'm not sure anybody can really know that and I said well if you were to die today again God forbid may live a long time um, and God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And she said, I would tell God that I've tried to be a good person, and I hope that I've done a few more good things than bad. Now, I think she was a genuine believer, just poorly catechized. And the Holy Spirit prompted me to point to the crucifix in her living room. And I said, you know, if we could earn salvation by doing a few more good things than bad. In fact, that implies that God grades on some kind of a significant curve. If that's the case, why did Jesus go to the cross? And she looked at the crucifix and she looked at me and she said, it doesn't quite make sense, does it, that if I could earn my salvation by being better than bad, good, more, more, more good than evil, um, why did Jesus die on the cross? And I said, he died on the cross because our works alone, apart from God's grace and Jesus' payment for our sins, can't save us. Jesus had to go to the cross and die for our sins, to forgive the sins of our, in our past, and then to offer us forgiveness as needed going forward. And then once we become a child of God and we receive that grace of forgiveness that comes directly from the cross as God's gift, then God gives us daily grace to be able to live the commandments. And over time, we're able to become saints. So I leave you with these two questions. If, they're, if they help you at all, use them. Um, I found them to be very helpful, especially when I just have a quick conversation with somebody a few minutes and I never, never, may never see them again, like the mechanic or somebody in the airport or whatever. I found it to be helpful. So God bless you. May you be fruitful in your evangelization. And remember, most of the time, our part is just to move somebody forward a little bit. And every now and then, we'll work with a person um, who is just ready. God bless you. May you be a faithful evangelist, and a great missionary disciple for God's glory. Talk to you again soon. Bye.